Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risks. But to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for the free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Phil Bach. Phil, are you ready to join the mission? Let's do it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so let's uh let me introduce you to the audience. Phil is the CEO of Armada ETFs, a REIT specialty asset manager that delivers customized solutions to REIT investors through ETFs, SMAs, and proprietary AI and machine learning REIT valuation models. And for my mother who's listening, mom, that means he does a lot of smart stuff. Phil has previously served as a C founder and CEO of Exponential ETFs, acquired by Title Financial Group, Chief Investment Officer at Signal Advisors, and Managing Director at the New York Stock Exchange. Phil is the author of two patents on innovative ETF structures and has led market structure enhancements that have become industry standard. Phil has been featured in top tier media outlets such as Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, CNBC, Financial Times, and Reuters. Phil is the host of the Phil Bot podcast and writes regularly on Substack. Phil, take in a minute and, and tell us about the unique value you are bringing to this wonderful world. Unique value. Other than my, uh, my, my lovely head of hair, I would say, um, you know, I think I have a very uh, healthy disrespect of authority and disrespect for the status quo. Um, but at the same time, a very healthy respect for you know, mathematics and, and for, you know, quantitative processes and first order principles and, you, you know, where um, I, I think that kind of, you know, has tended to serve me very well, where there's, you know, a lot of skepticism and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of willingness to say, hey, maybe, maybe everyone's wrong. Maybe, you know, we can do this a better way. Maybe there's a totally different way of thinking about something, but at the same time being tethered by, you know, the, the, the basic rules of the road, the rules of, of you know, like I said, of mathematics and, and quantitative analysis. So you can't, you know, veer too far off. Um, and I think there a lot of people in our industry in finance tend to fall into one of two buckets, right? You either tend to be, you know, very uh, quantitative, or you tend to be more of a social person and, and you know, end up more on the sales side of things. And uh, I think on the quantitative side and on the portfolio management side, I, I, I don't know that there's a tremendous amount of creativity these days. And especially mm. as we, you know, as we come out of an era where for so long, the consensus view, the herd mentality, um, you know, just buy market cap weight indexes, there's a Fed put, there's no risk, just keep putting money in. And people are, I think, thinking less and less critically about how they invest. And the more that happens and the bigger the consensus view gets relative to the contrarians, to me, the more opportunity there is for people who are contrarian to do things a little bit differently, a little bit differently, not, you know, not certainly not a bear or anything like that. But I do think that I've, you know, tended to look at the world through a little bit of a, um, a unique lens in some instances. And I think that would be, if I had to pick, that would be my unique uh, trait that I bring to the market. Interesting about the status quo, you know, um, I have a lecture I do in my valuation masterclass called 14 Fallacies you know, in equity valuation and in, you know, I, but there's one fallacy above all that I basically present many examples of to my students. And that is the bandwagon fallacy or the bandwagon effect where everybody is on the bandwagon and that becomes a status quo and going against the bandwagon or hanging off and seeing what's going on outside the bandwagon is just not rewarded at all. And I think the bandwagon effect is, you know, the idea that, uh, and, and it's interesting if you go back into your, your old days in Europe, 200 years ago or more, when basically a circus would come to town and that circus would have a bandwagon and it would make a lot of noise. And that would be how they would enter the city and then set up at that location, which they've all pre-planned and the kids all follow along and everybody wants to join the bandwagon so that they get to see the circus getting set up. And in a week, it's going to launch 
and everybody's on the bandwagon. And so um, I like the idea of against the status quo or not following the bandwagon all the time. You don't have to be against the bandwagon all the time also, but just think about what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, you know, you do need, you know, I, I, I've been saying a lot on, on Twitter and different places. I've been talking about how narratives drive flows, flows drive performance. Right. And, and you, know, you talk about fallacies and valuation, like being right, you know, doesn't necessarily reward you these days. Right. It's not necessarily about being right. It's about being ahead of the flows. Right. But, you know, so I think, um, but, but, you know, one of the consequences of that change, one, there's a few that are not good, but one of them is uh, investor complacency. And, and I think there is a lot of investor complacency right now. And, you know, look, things that are working, people are very reluctant to move off of things that are working. And things are working for a long time. You know, the hmm. same strategies have been working for a long time. The strategies that have not been working, the value strategies, some strategies that have not been working, have not been working for a long time now. Long enough that there's a whole, you know, new class of, She's investment officers and and portfolio managers and, and people that are actually driving flows now that have never seen them work and are skeptical of them. There's there's cyclicalities in the market. You know, there's there's mm. cyclicalities, whatever those forces are that we go from growth to value, from domestic to international, all these different things, they play out over time and they're gonna play out again. And you know, when they, you know, when they turn, those slowest to adapt and change, those most stuck in their ways, those most entrenched in what they've done so far. Are the ones that get wiped out and and you know that tends to happen every 10 10 or so years and i think we're due for that to happen again now i'm just curious about um you know there's there's two things that i i'm interested about in relation to reits and um the first one is that i i've looked at adding reits in the one of my asset allocation portfolios and every time i run the correlations it's just it's too correlated with equity and therefore, uh, you know, because REITs are in equity indices, because mo many of those REITs are listed. And also, you know, um, they're they're not, it's not like I'm owning land in those REITs. So it's not like a counter, uh, you know, uh, and that that's the first reason. So therefore, I look at REITs as kind of a, 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 like a little bit of beta on uh, real estate, but I don't really need it unless I'm ready to make some of those bets. So my first point my first question is about what what is the state of REITs right now and how should somebody who's thinking I need diversification how should they think about you know REITs in a, in the US nowadays so very interesting question there's a lot of ways a lot of places I can go with that um REITs are highly correlated to equities but not as much as you would think there there are actually in some in some cases it's uh you know, there are correlations to fixed. In some cases, it's, it, it operates independently. And, and there's, there's a lot of different factors and reasons driving REITs. Um, there is significantly more interest rate sensitivity with REITs than there is with uh, with equities. Um, they pay typically higher dividends than, than most equities, or most equity classes. So, you know, you do have a little bit of elements of fixed income in there. Um, tends to be, historically, tends to be very sensitive to inflation. It's inflation protection. But now we're at a kind of a different paradigm shift where we've had we have inflation, right? But you know we have uh, I think you might say stagflation, and you might say that a lot of real estate is already overvalued. So you have a lot of kind of different, almost contracting factors at play. And some you know we talk about cyclicality. Some of these different factors cycle in and out. And I think the main thing that we're seeing in REITs is that the subsector correlations, which are already very low, lower in fact than most style box equity correlations. There's you know very different economies and drivers of the different subsectors within REITs, those are going to be increasingly uh, divergent from each other um, for a number of reasons. So, you know, when you look at, um, you know, uh, data centers, right? So there's, uh, you know, if you look at the Jim Chano short thesis and you look at some of the business models, there's a lot of questions being asked, a lot of competitive threats there. But at the same time, you've got this tremendous growth, especially now in the tailwinds of this AI boom. So you have like a whole, you know, separate economy there. You've got these, data centers, you've got hospital REITs, you have all these different kinds of REITs. You have office REITs, which, you know, people are trying to catch a falling knife and maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. I wouldn't want to own them. I, I don't have the courage. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that you could say that they're a little bit risky. I think when you look at in the U.S., when you look at the supply demand imbalance of housing, you look at the demographic trends, there's a lot of reasons to like residential. And that's what we like. We, we like residential. We have a fund that, you know, operates off that thesis. But, you know, look, at the end of the day, I think I, I in 
you know, I, for most of my career, I always felt like a read is a read. I never thought too mm. deeply about it. And what really got me hooked on this project and starting Armada was when I started to look at REITs for the first time based on somebody else's research and coming into somebody else's, um, you know, fund, I saw that there was a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of divergence or a lot, the, the REIT sector was getting pulled by a lot of different factors. Some were conflicting, some were lined up. And it, I just thought it was a very interesting space you know, talk about a space that doesn't have a lot of, you know, innovation and, and mm. free thinkers. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit boring. REITs are boring. And I'm like, man, I think I can make REITs sexy. I think oh, I can. Oh, man, make so that's, REITs sexy that's again. The goal here. Yes, exactly. Uh, there, there is a challenge. Um, you know, one <laughs> of the things about, uh, I was a bank analyst for 10 years here in Thailand when we were going through the boom period and then the 97 crisis and then having to recapitalize balance sheets. Non-performing loans at the height of that crisis were 55% of total loans. I don't think that there was a country that went through something worse, maybe Indonesia, possibly, but around the world, the Latin America debt crisis and other things never reached that level of non-performing loans. One of the things that's interesting about um, <clears throat> the U.S. banks is that because of the um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you have the ability, banks have the ability to sell their uh, mortgages into the secondary market. So if we look at the balance sheet of the banks and we look at their lending related to real estate, first, their mortgages, they can get off their books quickly if they wanted to because there's such a liquid secondary market for mortgages, which are you know residential single family mortgages. And when we're talking about REITs and when we're talking about real estate, well, there's other types of loans there's commercial loans and you know loans for commercial buildings or maybe there's you know um, rentals or something like that. How how does someone look at the different general categories of REITs these days in the U.S.? I know there's a huge swath of different ones, but what would you say are the general categories? If someone says I want to get into REITs and I'm going to just go for the biggest ones and I'm going to try to kind of diversify across REITs, where would they, what would it, what would it be? Cell towers or what would that be? Well, so the, there's structural categories and then there are like asset class categories, right? So structurally you've got public and private REITs okay. and that's our, I mentioned the one fund, we have a whole nother fund that's, you know, really built on the thesis that there are some issues with the, with the private REITs and we think we could fix them using the public REITs. But, you know, those are issues, that's a whole wormhole that would take us hours to get through. But, you know, essentially there are issues around valuation, uh, liquidity, transparency, pricing, I mean, all, you know, all the usual stuff. So it's just the same story over and over, just different, mm -hmm. uh, different names of the product types. But, um, you know, the, the other areas are, um, you know, there, there are eight different subsectors. There's, you know, residential, there's office, which is, you know, kind of shaky. You've got um, cell towers, you've got hospital REITs, you've got, you mentioned earlier, uh, you're not investing in land, there actually are now, I think one or two land, uh, farmland REITs. So, so there's, there's all sorts of different categories and you can access, you know, different strategies, different geographies, different property types, you can, you know, different classes, you, you can get all sorts of different exposures through these public REITs. Um, in order to be a REIT, they have to pass through 90% of their income as dividends. So they, you know, they typically are, you know, dividend payers. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been historically a very stable asset class. I don't want to be a victim to what I was talking yeah. about with investor complacency, but, you know, especially not in this market. Um, but, but I do want to get back to your point about the banks. Uh, in the commercial real estate market, there is a tremendous amount of uh, commercial real estate mortgages that are going to have to be refinanced at higher rates. And that is very much a concern on the commercial real estate side. And what, what happens in that type of case? Because we know in the case where interest rates rise a lot, as they have, that eventually every time the Fed rides us up a roller coaster of super high rates, they take us down very quickly afterwards yeah. and <clears throat> you've got the fed buying you know that the giant sucking sound that we used to say about jobs going i think to mexico was the old saying but the giant sucking sound is the fed buying sucking out of the system all the mortgage backed securities that it could get and injecting liquidity but when i look at commercial loans uh commercial real estate it doesn't seem like it's that easy for the banks to get these off their balance sheets compared to, let's say, the secondary market that there is in mortgages. So what do you think is going to happen in that space? If if we could say, let's just assume that it's going to be a rough ride for commercial real estate for the next, I don't know, three to five years. 
there's there's no liquidity at all in the commercial real. I mean, the biggest buyers of commercial real estate have been these private REIT funds from Blackstone, Starwood, KKR, uh, and now they're all sellers and they've had to gate their funds. The investors can't get out. It's a whole, it's a, it's a major problem. Um, there is, there's an assumption, there's just a broad assumption in the commercial real estate market that, well, you know, rates are going to be going back down and, and very soon, you know, either through, you know, the Fed having achieved its goals or through um, a recession. And um, I don't think, you know, it's obviously not a certainty. It might not even be a probability, more of a possibility. And I don't think that people are truly accepting of, you know, the reality of where we are in the cycle. And look, it's not just, it's not just real estate. I mean, you look at uh, zombie companies, you look at, you know, corporates that have to refinance themselves in order to stay afloat because they can't even make their, you know, their revenues aren't enough to pay off their debt service. Uh, you look at the U.S. government itself and their debt service payments, right? I mean, there are some major, major issues if, those rates don't or can't come down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got to commend, I've been very critical of the Fed, you know, really my whole career, but they are actually sticking to their guns and, and trying to do something about inflation. I personally think rates should be even higher. I think there's no excuse for rates to ever be lower than CPI, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's, to me, that's a regressive tax, but, you know, they are still sticking to their guns, at least for now. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, there's, um, I think, a lot of risk that is being, you know, kind of underestimated by the market right now. And and the next few months are, I think are going to be very, the market's been very calm mm -hmm. you know, over the last couple of months and maybe they'll stay calm, but there's a lot more risk than is being priced in by, let's say the VIX. And um, one last question on this whole topic, just because you're in the U S I'm outside of the U S so I don't really have a good feel on it. But if we were to look at the idea of recession, where we clearly go into a recession, what do you think is the probability that, let's say, by the end of this year, it becomes clear that we're we're in a recession? It's just so hard to say because the employment numbers have been so good and so sticky, and and it just defies. It not only defies logic; it defies my lived reality. I mean, just from the people I know and, mm. and in my circle, it seems like that's not so much the case, but you know, the data is the data. And, um, you know, until there's some sort of break in the employment numbers, you have to say that that recession is being staved off. But I mean, you know, look, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't, you know, I can't say it seems to me that we're long overdue for, you know, for a recession. It seems to me that it's, you know, it's coming based on all these factors and others that we haven't discussed. But you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, this. Who knows? I mean, I. You know, there's just mm -hmm. no way. There's no. Way, there's no guarantees. There's no certain. I mean, everything. Everyone in this industry. Anyone who's in finance, deals in probabilities. Everything yeah. is probabilities, right? My investment strategies. We're trying to tilt the odds in our favor. We can't guarantee anything. We tilt the odds, right? Um. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, the odds are likely of a recession. The odds are likely of of a lot of things, but you know, there's certainly no guarantee and and. You know, the people who've been calling for recessions have been wrong more often than not ever since the global financial crisis. So, you know, don't underestimate the power of the Fed to come in and overreact and spend money that they don't have and, you know, mm. do whatever else they can to try to, you know, to try to stave off the inevitable. So, um, you know, the market could stay rational a whole lot longer than you or I can stay solvent. So, um, It's interesting because I've been presenting to my clients and I, I have a chart. I think I'll share that chart. And it's because I face the same question about unemployment is so low. It's like, this is such a strong economy. Um, you listen to someone like Peter Schiff as an example, and he'll say, well, yeah, but you got to break those numbers down and it's not what it looks like. But um, here's a chart that I'll share, uh, which is my look at recession. So for the listeners out there, it's a chart that shows uh, the unemployment rate uh, going up and down over time, uh, ranging between almost 16% during COVID time, all the way down to, let's say, 3.7% in 1965, you know, when I was born, let's say, at that time. And what's interesting is that every time that it comes down to a pretty low low, we see that there's a recession. So I've yeah, like put that. Yeah. in there. And this yeah. helped me to kind of explain to my clients, one of the, one of the arguments for a recession in the U.S., is that that peak employment is actually telling us that you know that that the market is just about to 
So the, the economy is just about to go into recession. Now, yeah. you know, one, one chart doesn't tell the whole story, but it's definitely something that, you know, gets me thinking about <laughs> what the heck's happening. And it's, it's difficult, I think, for everybody to try to figure this out. So I appreciate, you know, sharing some of your expertise in the, in the REIT space and then some of your, you know, experience of what you're seeing there. I think we're all trying to figure it out nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Circumstances I had, uh, uh, was joking about the hair. I got a full head of hair. I was, I, was, I was a kid. It was actually probably my first investment. It was my first investment experience. Um, which was good because, you know, I, I learned a lot of hard lessons um, young and they're, they're really, you know, they stuck with me. I mean, I learned them painfully. I learned them the hard way. I probably lost about 40 bucks, maybe 50 bucks on, on this trade, which, and, and now, so, you know, just to kind of spoil it, I'm going back to when I was about 12, 13 years old. And that was, you know, a full summer of babysitting and, and uh, mowing lawns and, and all my money, all the money I had. And at the time, we were just coming off of a bubble of baseball cards and my older brother had all these baseball cards and, and you know, it had done very well and they're all worth, you know, we had this thing called the Beckett baseball card monthly, which I guess is like the, you know, the Bloomberg terminal of the day. It was, it was a printed thing and you'd flip through and you look at your cards and these things would only go in one direction and only go straight up. And, you know, I'm, I'm 14 years old. I had no concept of a tulip bubble, right. Or anything like that. Like to me, this is, Oh wow. Like you invest in baseball cards. They just go up. And, um, you know, I would, like I said, I would, you know, babysitter Mulan's or whatever, scrounge together a few dollars, go to the store, buy a pack of baseball cards. And then, you know, we started going, my brother and I started going to these baseball card shows and, and you know, you'd have people there and they'd have these tables and they'd have all these cards. And I saved up and I bought this um, Roberto Clemente card, which is like blue chip. I mean, he, he, he was long passed away. Like there's no way for him to devalue. It wasn't a rookie, but it was still, it was like a very, val it was a blue chip card. That's a card yep. that's going to hold his value, right? And I had that. And um, I was a Met fan. And uh, there's a, a young guy coming up, Greg Jeffries, and he was going to be the next big thing, right? Big prospect. And I bought the hype. And with baseball cards, the thing is you want to have the, the rookie card, the first year of a new player is the most valuable thing. And this guy mm. was just coming up. And the amount of things looking back that like, you know, the amount of things that I know now, right, with a whole, you know, a whole career in finance and, you know, the, you know, performance chasing, the, the hype, the sample size, the, you know, scarcity and, and diversification concentration, um, the intrinsic value, all these things. I didn't know anything. So, right? so I got excited, right? Oh, we got this, you know, this new superstar coming up. Obviously, he's going to be a superstar because, you know, I saw it on, on you know, the TV show or whatever. He's on Sports Illustrated. So I sold my Roberto Clemente card. I sold all my cards and I decided I'm going to invest. In, I'm going to pull all my money together. I'm going to buy just this one <laughs> pile into this one stock, right? I'm going to buy this one guy. And I got myself a bounty of like maybe 25, 30 of these cards of, of these Greg Jeffries rookie cards. And it was like, to me, it was like the greatest, like, you know, this is a short thing. This guy is the next big superstar of the Mets. These cards are clearly going to be worth $40, $50 a piece in, in just a couple of years, the way Daryl Strawberry and Dwight Gooden, these other guys were. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the end of the story, it just never, you know, never came to be. The guy had a career. He had, I think he had a good season or two. But, you know, the, there were two things. The, the the player itself never really panned out. But also the entire baseball card uh, bubble also, you know, um, uh, collapsed and you know, to be a part of that and to see that and to watch that and watch like, you know, you get those baseball cards, you look it up and like, what do you mean? My Greg Jeffries is now worth 12 cents. How could that be? That's impossible. Of course, that's <laughs> like the book value. You can't get that. You can get like maybe a third of that. Um, but there were a lot of things that happened with those baseball cards that now it's like, it's, it's so obvious. Like when these things started to become very valuable, more and more companies came in, produced more and more cards or printing, you know, a ton of cards or all these different versions um, you know, that is, that's the, you know, the scarcity and, and, uh, you know, they, 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 they blew the golden goose, right? All they had to do was control themselves and, and keep it scarce. Um, the, uh, the volatility of a, of a rookie baseball player, something I had never considered, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, a player like Roberto Clemente that had a Hall of Fame career and is now passed away, he can't tarnish that. He can't have a bad season to ruin that, right? That's, that's locked in. That's booked, right? <laughs> that's, that's book value. Um, 
but uh, but a rookie baseball player, you know, you really just don't know. Some of them work out, some of them don't. Again, we, you know, I said before, we deal in probabilities, right? The probability of a rookie player uh, panning out, even the best prospect, you know, whatever it is, maybe it's 50%. A little more, a little less, but um, but there's certainly no guarantee, and it was no guarantee, and I wasn't hedged, right? I had no way to hedge mm. it. I wasn't diversified. I was concentrated. Um, so I fell victim to every single one of those, uh, every single one of those rules that you would tell someone not to fall victim to, and um, I still somewhere in my, uh, in my, in my, you know, closet of my parents' room, I still somewhere have a, uh, a stack of Greg Carefree's rookie cards that are you know, literally worthless. I, I doubt I can get a dollar for the whole bunch, but, uh, but the lessons were, were very good. It's made me very skeptical as an investor, um, slow to hop on new bandwagons, which mm. in some cases, maybe, you know, the last, the manias of the last few years, with you know, crypto and NFTs, maybe, you know, might've cost me some money, but I think over the long term it'll serve me well. Um, mm. you know, but certainly it's made me a more cautious investor and a more, uh, you know, an investor more cognizant of, you know, intrinsic value, risk management, and, you know, the, the basics. It's uh, it's great. You learned so many different lessons from that. Um, and you're the first person to tell the story of, you know, baseball card losses, but for the, for the listeners and the viewers out there, Roberto Clemente was, you know, such a impressive figure. Uh, I believe Puerto Rican uh, by birth, he played for the Pittsburgh pirates at the time and um he i remember when i was living in connecticut i was a young kid and so we listened to baseball games on on the radio and stuff like that and my father was from his family was from pittsburgh so i had this connection with pittsburgh and then i started following roberto clemente he was kind of the first athlete i followed as a young young kid and basically i mean we're talking about like seven or eight years old at that time that i got into it and I remember that um, I remember when he died, you know, he died in a, in a plane crash and he was going on a, a mission, I believe, to Nicaragua at the time. It was 1970, 1972, something like that. And it was just a really first time that I, I really felt so sad about somebody that was really, you know, such a, a shining light. So uh, when the listeners hear Roberto Clemente, they may not understand that that was, you know, that was blue chip premium, a phenomenal guy. And so, yeah. So how would you um, summarize the lessons that you learned? What would you say is the the, the key thing? Uh, so yeah, not only was he a great guy and, and beloved and all that, but it was also, um, you know, he played before this whole proliferation of baseball cards. So there was, there was scared, like have, not everyone had, you know, it wasn't like it became in the late eighties, early nineties when everyone was investing in baseball cards. So having a Roberto Clemente card was, it's like having a, you know, a call, a call option. That's like, you know, 20% in the money, right. You know, it's there, look, the market might move down and it might move up, but you have, you're in the money. You have, you're right. You've got a book gain here. And then to, to sell that, to buy like, you know, eight or nine or however many I was able to get, of this, uh, Greg Jeffries was like, you know, taking all your, taking that option, selling it and putting it into your cousin's startup because he just got valued uh, <laughs> in a series A round by a VC at 50 million bucks. And you're just like, you know, hoping for this insane growth trajectory that, you know, just <laughs> doesn't always come. So I think, um, you know, like, you know, the lessons learned, uh, you know, I think it has made me a very, um, a more prudent and, and a almost uh, in some, in some cases, more cautious investor. Now, by nature, I am a bit of a risk taker, a calculated risk taker, but I am a bit of a risk taker. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and I think, you know, when when I see an opportunity, when I think the odds are in my favor, I'm not afraid to take those risks and do it. And I've done that even within my own career. But there's always a little part of me that's like, hey, let me make sure I have, you know, let me make sure that we've worked out a plan here where we're building some, you know, we're building some intrinsic value. We're building something mm -hmm. that's that's real. We're building something that is, you know, can't be, you know, we're putting in a moat, we're putting, you know, different things. In my last company, we uh, we had a couple of ETFs. We also built an ETF sub-advisory business where we did outsource trading and capital markets to, you know, to have, you know, not just the high flyers of our own funds, but also some mm -hmm. stable income uh, coming in. And I think we have some similar plans with, with my new company. Um, and a lot of that is because, you know, I saw, look, this, Greg Jeffries guy has a bad year, right? And all of a sudden my investment goes down to zero because of something that I didn't foresee, which I should have mm. foreseen, but didn't foresee coming. 
Um, you know, expect the unexpected, be prepared, have a backup plan, be diversified, diversified in a number of different ways, diversified by revenue stream, diversified by, you know, people and relationships. And I mean, in every which way that you can, um, I think, you know, those are lessons that, that, you know, have served me and hopefully will serve me very well that I, I can point to that as my first investing experience as where I learned that lesson. Um, and and I'll, I'm going to tell a story of kind of what I learned from this by relating it to a story um, of something I did. Um, many years ago, I lived in the desert area out in, uh, you know, New Mexico area. <clears throat> and I lived near a lot of rattlesnakes that they had there in a particular area. If you walked out, you know, into the the, the that area, you're going to definitely encounter a lot of rattlesnakes. And I knew to, you know, wear these rubber boots that I wore that were up to my freaking hips. So if I was to get, you know, attacked, I would, you know, they couldn't get me and all that. But a friend of mine asked me to uh, babysit their baby who was only like six months old. So I took the baby out to the rattlesnake area, thought this would be pretty cool. And I put the baby down and had the baby walk through the rattlesnake area. And the sad part of the story is that the baby didn't even know that the rattlesnakes were dangerous so the baby was grabbing at these rattlesnakes it didn't recognize that the 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 rattle in the in their tail was you know a sign of danger and to get away and unfortunately the rattlesnakes all bit the baby and my i had to tell my friend that the baby died and you know it was terrible it was part of the reason why i had to leave the u.s but no i'm just making up that story <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> the point of the story is when you're a babe in the woods, when you're a baby and you don't know anything, you are exposing yourself to risks that you have no idea what they are. And I think this is a great story. And, and as as I think about it for, you know, for the, the listeners and the viewers out there, you know, you got to understand that there's lots of risks around the corner that you don't know about until you get some experience. So be very careful be very, you know, mindful, try to learn as much as you, you, you can, but don't put all of your money down. So that's how, that's what I would take away. Anything you would add to that amazing story I just told? That is a great story because look, until you have a concept of the rattlesnakes being dangerous, you don't have a concept. And there are a lot of investors today that have no concept of stocks being dangerous. Stocks go up, you buy them, you wait, they go up, they go down, wait a little longer, eventually they go up. And that's been their lived experience. So you know, I, I wouldn't trust necessarily an asset manager that hasn't lived through a bear market, right? Or I'd be more skeptical at least. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and a bear market can mean a lot of things. It can mean stocks. It could also mean these kinds of lessons, you know. And for me, it was Greg Jeffries. Maybe somebody, yeah. you know, bought a condo at the wrong time, bought a house at the wrong time. They, you know, left their job and went to a startup that didn't go the right way. I mean, you know, people, you know, this is what your podcast is. People learn this lesson a million different ways. And yeah. um, I think as long as you you know, learn it, recognize it and can grow from it. You know, that is in effect, you know, understanding that the rattlesnakes are dangerous and that'll make us all smarter investors. Um, so let's now, let's now bring this down to actionable advice. This is the hardest question because <clears throat> I'm asking you for one action. So the question is, you know, you've learned a lot from that experience. You learn a lot from your experience in life. Let's now imagine a young person that doesn't really know exactly what they're doing, but, you know, they have some eagerness to get involved. What's one action that you'd recommend that they would take to avoid suffering the same fate? Everyone says past performance is no guarantee of future results and everyone performance chases. And I see it over and over and over again. The worst time to invest in anything is after a big run, right? Because there's always, there's an element of mean reversion. Um, there are cyclicalities. Um, never chase, just don't chase, mm. never chase. Be patient. You missed it. You missed it. There's more. There's always, there's another train coming, right? Isn't that like a monger? There's another, there's always another opportunity coming. There's another trade coming, another train, another trade. Mm. Um, don't chase, just, yep. just don't chase. Don't, you know, get rid of the FOMO, get rid of the, uh, you know, whatever anxiety, whatever, you know, these things are, um, detach yourself. Just wait. Got it. So what's a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? Um, a resource, I, I think podcasts like this, I think mm. there's so much great analysis and insight available to curious people now. Yeah. Um, you know, you can listen to podcasts, you can, you know, read books, you can read blogs, Substacks. there's so much great work on Substack now. Um, you know, it, it, I'd say the, the whole, the total amount that I've learned, you know, studying for a CFA or Kaya or, uh, you know, certainly as an undergrad, 
you take all that and and if I can lock myself in a room for three weeks just listening to investment podcasts and maybe you know going deep on a couple topics you know just through publicly available information blogs and SSRN if you really want to dive in mm. or you know there is so much more information available to us now than we've ever had and I would say take advantage of that and that's you know learn from untraditional channels but you'll learn more and you'll learn faster. Great, great advice. All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Well, I've got a young business that we're trying to get off the ground here. So uh, we've got a merger. We're, we're merging with uh, an AI development company and onboarding some AI models with REITs. Uh, we've got two new funds that we're trying to you know get to critical mass. So we've got a lot of work cut out for us. Um, if I got to pick one goal, I would say... Uh, I would say to um, to finish a Series A round of capital for for the company, um, and to make sure that we're, you know, we can uh, execute our plan over the next three years. Exciting! <clears throat> Capitalism is the lifeblood of where you know the entrepreneur is the lifeblood of innovation, and um, so congratulations on that. And I really look forward to hearing your success over the next twelve months. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Phil, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Thoughts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? That's it. Stay curious. And uh, thanks for having me on. This is a ton of fun. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate it too. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside. <laughs>